Dog Works Radio Network presents Mushing Radio, hosted by Robert Forto. Mushing Radio is about dog-powered sports, living in the Great White North, and mushing. Visit our website at mushingradio.com. Here is your host, Robert Forto. Hello and welcome everybody. This is Robert Forto and you're listening to Mushing Radio here on KVRF 89.7 in the Matsu Valley. RadioFreePalmer.org is our live streaming site. You can find us on iTunes. Just search for Dog Works Radio. We're also under the same name under all social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram as well. Just search for Dog Works Radio, and here is our show. We are here with Miranda Sheely. She is an up-and-coming musher at Team Ineke and also a recent participant on our winter multi-sport expedition at UAA. Miranda, how's it going? Great. Beautiful day. It is a beautiful day. Can you introduce yourself? Tell us who you are and what you're all about. I am Miranda Sheely. I am a senior at UAA, and I'm majoring in outdoor leadership. I just finished my last year of collegiate ski racing, and now I've got all this free time, so I decided to start up mushy. So you are originally from Colorado, and you've been a ski bum most of your life, is that right? Yep. (laughs) How did you get involved with skiing, and more importantly, how did you end up in Alaska on their ski team? I started skiing at a very young age, and skied for my whole life, and then once I graduated high school, I took a year off to improve my national standing. And uh, that's when I came up to Alaska for a race, and I just absolutely fell in love with it. So then I started talking to the coach, and then that next year I came up here and was on the ski team. So what type of skiing do you do, and in your opinion, how good are you? I do giant slalom and slalom in college, and I'm definitely better at slalom. Um, But I would say middle of the pack, good. So for our listeners that don't know anything about skiing other than the Olympics every four years, what are the different types of events in skiing? The different types, the biggest and the fastest, where you basically go straight downhill, is downhill. And then Super G has a little bit more turn shape, but still very fast, like 80 miles an hour. And then Giant Slalom is kind of making like big S turns across the hill and that's probably about 40 miles an hour and then slalom is very little tight quick turns around poles that's probably around 20 20 miles an hour and you grew up near Breckenridge Colorado sort of a ski haven in uh, the front range there where did you learn how to ski? What mountain, what, uh, you know, what ski hills, that sort of thing? Well, I was born in Denver, so I learned how to ski at Winter Park because my mom was a big ski legend there. And then once we moved up to Summit County when I was in second grade, I spent most of my time skiing at Copper and A Basin and Breckenridge with my local club team, Team Summit. Excellent. So now here you are in your early 20s up in Alaska. You're on the ski team, and you had to figure out what you're going to do in school. What brought you to the outdoor program, and was that your first choice? Definitely not my first choice. I uh, came up here, and my freshman year, I was just so excited about Alaska. I took about 10 Alaska Native classes, including a language class, an art class, a history class. So I just had an incredible freshman year. And then uh, I decided I wanted to do physical therapy, so I went into physical education with the health and leadership concentration. And I went at that for about a year, and then I started the outdoor leadership minor, and just realized I love the outdoor classes so much and that was much more suited to me. So 
then I switched to the outdoor leadership major, and here we are. So before we get into our big expedition trip, can you tell our listeners a little bit about the outdoor program at Alaska? And I think when a lot of people think about that, they think about, at least in the PE program, they think about you know, football players in the big colleges that don't have to go to class, they're just kind of doing their own thing, and then they, they get a degree without doing anything. So how does that compare to sort of a popular opinion to what this program is all about? Maybe describe the program and then sort of its benefits. Well, I would say a big misconception about our major is you're automatically going to be a PE teacher, which is definitely not true. Um, the degree really covers everything from like technology, communication, uh, lesson plans, wellness, everything in health and fitness and outdoor recreation. And then the outdoor leadership side does a lot of like planning and programming for recreation activities, as well as uh, leading in outdoor activities such as like kayaking or ice climbing and do, taking roles in any of those activities. So you had mentioned that you sort of went all over the place your first couple of years here in school going from that native study type with art and languages then you went to a PE track but now from my understanding you want to do therapeutic recreation. What is that and what is your end goal? Therapeutic recreation is in simple terms, doing outdoor therapy with any type of people, like military people or people with disabilities or anything like that. And my end goal would be to work with people with disabilities and post-military people and just getting them outdoors and doing something as simple as going for a hike or teaching them how to ski or going backcountry skiing or dog mushing or anything like that. So within our program, you have to do several outdoor trips. Obviously, it's outdoor leadership, so you learn leadership skills while you're out there. And you had mentioned they have ice climbing and sea kayaking, that sort of thing. You have to take six of these courses in order to graduate. What have you taken, what do you anticipate taking, and what has been the most fun so far? I have taken beginner sea kayaking, intermediate sea kayaking, winter camping, crevasse rescue, backpacking, and the multi-sport expedition. So you had mentioned coming up here you fell in love with Alaska, and I don't think that there's a better way for a person of your attitude, I guess, to see Alaska other than being in the outdoors with some of these courses. How does this compare to that art course that you studied or that language course that you studied about Alaska? Can you give a little bit of a compare and contrast between actually doing stuff in Alaska versus looking or learning about it? The Alaska Native classes really opened my eyes as a 19-year-old girl from Colorado to like eating seal and moose and all the different native languages. But the outdoor classes definitely opened me up to how different Alaska is than Colorado, just like by merely size as well as everything else. So now let's talk a little bit about our expedition. You came along, you were sort of handpicked along with the other How many was it? Six other participants? So we sort of handpicked all of you guys to do this trip. I've talked about this trip a lot on our show, but this is our first time of having somebody on as a guest. What what were you getting yourself into when you first heard about this? I remember talking to you about this like a year and a half ago. We were taking a class together, and I said, we're going to do this trip. Hopefully you can come along. And without hesitation... You said, yeah, I'm ready to go. (laughs) Is that just your nature? You just sort of, let's just jump into this and rock and roll? Or or what what was the deal? I think initially, yes. Um, And then as it crept closer, I kind of realized what I was getting myself into and how much planning it was and how nervous I was and how much you were actually 
on your own. It's not like all those other classes where you're just following behind a group on a hiking trail or kayaking next to 10 other people. You're you're sitting there on a snowmobile or on a dog sled or on a bike, and you're, you're by yourself. So can you describe sort of the trip in a couple of minutes, maybe some highs, some lows, what you did on the trip itself, sort of your experience as a whole? Um, I would really say it was all over the board to start with. Um, the There were some days that were just kind of boring river, but it was still beautiful. We were right in front of Denali. And then there were other days where we encountered group problems, dog problems, and we we made it through it. And then the, the last day is really what stuck out in my mind when I ran an 11 dog team through the most technical trail I have ever <laughs> been on. <laughs> And I fell multiple times. I lost the dog team. I screamed for my life. I, uh, yeah, it was eventful. It's probably a good word. So we went on this trip. It was about 150 miles in the Alaska backcountry. You had mentioned that you had done several trips as a group, but this trip sort of tested not only that group dynamic, but also the individual uh, part of the equation as well. Did you find yourself? Um, taking some of your experience and all the years of skiing and all the things that you've done in your life and applying those principles out there sort of all alone? Definitely. I uh, first had to tell myself to relax because I don't really like being alone. So I sang to myself, I talked to myself, I talked to the dogs. Um, But then it was also nice like relaxing time to think about how pretty it was and all the things going on and also a time to think about what if something happened. I'm very good at thinking about what if situations. <laughs> so you had mentioned that this you were in an, a leadership type degree, but you were on this course or this trip as a participant. How do you think that this trip prepared you for future courses and your internship in specific, and as a uh, sort of an emerging leader in the outdoor world, obviously that's your goal for being in this program. I think even though I was a participant, there was still times that each of us were leaders. Um, I really stepped up with the dogs and helped out when Robert was gone or anything like that or when something was going wrong or just helping out with my own dog team, trying to be as self-sufficient as I could. And uh, I think that really set me up for a lot of other opportunities in this uh, degree and outdoor recreation world because it just really opened my eyes to how many more options of outdoor recreation there was. I was kind of closed off to mostly skiing or hiking or things I was comfortable with, but this really opened my eyes to a new world. Speaking of that, uh, the outdoor program at UAA, in terms of the trips themselves, they are sort of specific in discipline, either they're land-based trip or water-based trip. And you had mentioned ski kayaking and and, uh, that sort of thing. And then they also have rock climbing, ice climbing, crevasse rescue, that sort of thing. You have been a skier your whole life, so it's really been about land-based adventure. If you could choose one side or the other, now that you have experience in both, which way do you like to go better, land or, or, or water? That's a tough one. If you would have asked me that five years ago, I would have said land. But <laughs> after my sea kayaking trip, it was really cool to do it up here where there are mountains that come all the way down to the water and paddling right up to glaciers. But uh, I think I would still say land because the uncertainty of water kind of freaks me out. It adds a little bit to it, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, speaking of that sea kayaking trip, I know you and I took a beginner's class, and we got kind of gypped on it a little bit. We ended up being on a, a large lake down in Kenai, so we didn't see much of the sea in our sea kayaking class. But the, uh, a year or two later, just last summer, you went on a much longer trip, like a week and a half long trip in Prince William Sound. 
and you were on the literally the ocean for a good portion of that. How was that? And, and just tell people about that. And the reason I bring that up is because so many people think that they can't do trips like this because it's so expensive. And if you go to a guided trip somewhere in Alaska, you may pay four, five, six thousand dollars for a week like that. But at UAA, you did this for like a thousand bucks. Maybe tell us a little bit about that and how can people do these trips even if they aren't a student? The, uh, the transition of beginner kayaking on the lake to intermediate kayaking right into the Prince William Sound was, was eye-opening to say the least. I was really nervous leaving the beach there. Um, we had a lot of different weather. We had rain, we had sun. We had four foot swells, we had flat water, uh, we paddled up to some glaciers, we saw whales and otters and seals, and it was really cool, and we camped on the beach every night, and we switched off uh, leaders of the day every day, so two students would kind of lead the day, and they would have to pick the route and make sure everyone was doing okay and staying hydrated. And I think it was really similar to the expedition because it was eye-opening to me as well as kind of had our own leadership role. And the UAA classes are really great because you also get the education part of it. You're not just a participant following around a guide, paying a bunch of money. And you don't have to give tips either. Yes. All right, so now let's switch gears a little bit. You have literally been on the back of a dog sled before this expedition for three miles in your life when you came out last year. And I remember when you came out to our place and we went out, it was relatively icy, it was late in the year, and I said, okay, Miranda, it's your turn to run home. And I said, I'm going to sit in the, in the bag, on, in the basket, and you're going to drive us home. So now, tell us about that. Tell us about that first mushing experience, and of course we're going to lead it into where we stay today. The first mushing experience was probably the scariest, because all I had in my mind was, don't let go, don't let go, don't let go. Um, but it was really cool to see how much power the dogs have, and really how responsive they are to listening to just the simplest commands of let's go or G or ha and uh, just how much personality they all have and I've definitely come to realize that a lot more after spending so much time with them but the uh, the first experience was exhilarating It'll get you more. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people call it the, the musher virus. Yeah. As soon as you get it, you're sort of stuck. So you had mentioned about the personalities of the dogs. And since this is mushing radio, this isn't just about getting on the runners and running. There is a huge component to that. And remember, a lot of folks that are listening to this all over the world have never had a chance to be on the back of a dog sled or in a dog kennel or a dog yard. Can you explain that a little bit and maybe tell us about a couple of your favorite dogs that you've met over the last year or so? Uh, Their personalities are really like people, to explain it the easiest. Uh, You've got the kind of grumpy old guys, the the grumpy old ladies, and then you've got the young guns who are kind of ready to go but don't really know quite what they're doing yet, and they kind of have to follow along and get bossed around every now and then. And then you got kind of the middle of the pack that they know what they're doing. They're old hats, and they just follow along. And uh, my two favorites are probably Wallace and Gromit because I got to do a little education piece on mushing with Robert at a school here in Anchorage. And we took the pups Wallace and Gromit and Swiss and Ski Leg out, and they were so tiny, they could barely walk. They were only a month old. And <laughs> I just carried them around and let the kids pet them and then walk them back to the car. And then Wallace and Gromit were both on the expedition, and my gosh, they are the tallest, gangliest dogs I have ever seen. And I would go and pet them every second I could. <laughs> you know, um, 
it's a proud moment. It's sort of a proud mom or dad moment when you see him out there because they truly became sled dogs on that trip, didn't they? Yeah. Can you explain that a little bit? They uh, they definitely figured it out. At the beginning, they're standing around and they were always excited, even when you were stopped, and they couldn't figure it out that if you said take a break, they didn't take a break, and then all the other dogs would lay down or relax, and they're still jumping around and barking, and then when we would set up camp, all the other dogs would immediately lay down on their hay and know that it was time to relax and they didn't have to worry about anything. And Wallace and Gromit would be the two puppies that were standing up when we were at camp for a lot of hours. But then towards the end of the trip, they were they were falling right along, laid down. They figured it out. You know, you're a, a young woman now, but I'm sure in the future you will have that moment where you send your son or daughter off to prom, and you will think about that for your whole life. And that's sort of how it is when those goofy puppies become (laughs) true sled dogs. It's one of those life-changing moments for them, and it's sort of a life-changing moment for the kennel. And I don't know if I had told you this or somebody else on the expedition. I said, "There's, there's the future of the team right there. It happened right then. When they, when the little light in their little head popped on, it sort of changed from sort of the changing of the guard, the old dogs, as you mentioned, to the young, the young pups in the kennel. It sort of just happened there on that week. It's kind of a magical thing, isn't it? Yes, it's really cool to see. So now, remember, you had only been on this sled a couple of times before this, and then you did this week-long trip with us, and. You did excellent, by the way. I'm sure I've told you that on more than one occasion. But now, you have been truly bitten by the mushing bug. Tell us what happened after the trip. Well, thank you. Uh, After the trip, my life kind of set on a whole new path, and I did my first dog mushing race at Chugiak, and uh, it was a night race. I had six dogs. And again, I was all by myself. I was very nervous, but all went well. I uh, came in fourth place, so it was a successful first race. And uh, then not shortly after that, I committed to uh, doing some more races next year and kind of pushing along my mushing career. (laughs) Your mushing career. So before we talk about this race, you had talked about at the beginning of the show how you took a year off to increase your college points for skiing, and now you're no longer eligible as a college student to be skiing. Is there anything left for you to do for skiing? And if so, what is that? And if there isn't, do you think that mushing will cover some of that void that you've had in your life since you were a little girl? Uh, There's definitely not much I can do for college ski racing. Um, the next step would probably be to become a coach or a ski instructor or something like that. Um, I would definitely like to do that next year. That way I don't completely stop skiing. But uh, I think the mushing will definitely help out with all of my free time I'll have on the weekends and anything like that. So if we could talk about that just for a second in regards to there's not much to do left in your college skiing career. And I think a lot of athletes feel that, you know, they play sports from, you know, as young as possible. I remember playing football for the first time at six years old and I didn't play in college, but I played um, sort of uh, club hockey and lacrosse in college. So I got a chance to do college sports that way. How do you think that that, how does that transition feel? You know, you've been doing this your whole life and then all of a sudden, it this is sort of over, and you go into coaching or whatever. Some people don't do anything. Like a lot of the football players, they may be a coach at a little high school somewhere, but otherwise, it just sort of smacks you in the face, doesn't it? Tell us about that. Definitely. Um, you could keep like skiing and go pro, but I'm not really interested in that. Um, Right now, I don't really realize it, that it's kind of all completely over, but I think in the fall when the team starts training again and traveling, 
that's when it'll really hit me that it's over and hopefully I'll have a job and do things to kind of take up my free time. Well, mushing can definitely take up your free time for <laughs> sure. And you had mentioned that you want to do a couple of races here in the upcoming 2017-2018. You learned a lot in the last year or so, but I always like to ask people as the last question on my show, if you could tell that person who's just getting involved in the sport, whether they want to, you know, one dog hook up to their bike or they want to want run Iditarod someday. What is that one piece of advice that you have learned over your time as a musher? And how could you help that person that's just, just has that dream to one day of running sled dogs? Well, I have two pieces. The first would be to definitely know your dogs and get to know each of them individually and know their traits and everything about them. And then the next piece would probably be to just relax. I still to this day white knuckle the drive bar on the sled. So, <laughs> But I think it would just be relaxed, take it in wherever you are, whether you're on a bike or on the sled on the beautiful trails below Denali, just relax and take it all in. So this is Miranda Sheely. She is an outdoor leadership major at the University of Alaska Anchorage. Miranda, is there a place where people can follow you along? Are you on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter? If so, how do they find you? I am on Facebook under Miranda Sheely, and my Instagram is Mr. Sheely. Mr. Sheely. We'll make sure we post a link to that on the show profile. Again, Miranda Sheely is our guest today. We will talk to you guys next time. Goodbye. This is what I've always wanted. Steve's got the stars. Got a big old cushy chair. It's nice. Today, premiere week keeps rolling with late night legend Jay Leno. How about that? Plus, Jordan Sparks. And coming Friday, Charlie Sheen and a performance by Leanne Rimes. It's all new and it's gonna be big. And it's all on Steve. Weekdays at 3 on Fox 5 Atlanta. This is what I've always wanted. Steve's got the stars. Got a big old cushy chair. It's nice. Today, premiere week keeps rolling with late night legend Jay Leno. How about that? Plus, Jordan Sparks. And coming Friday, Charlie Sheen and a performance by Leanne Rimes. It's all new and it's gonna be big. And it's all on Steve. Weekdays at 2 on NBC6.